you can accomplish a great deal when your organization is focused on its actual goal. And the goal of Fort Vermillion School Division being providing that education to the students, the best education possible. I think right now, and it, I don't know whether it's accumulation of 75 years of wisdom, but the Fort Vermillion School Division is, is very well placed to do a very good job. And I think it's doing a very good job. I, I think in the past it's done a good job too. I had four children graduate from high level public and they've all gone on to very successful careers. It's, um, this, this is a good school division. It does a very good job. And just because we're in the north, that shouldn't take away from that. In fact, if anything, I think it makes us better because we are where we are. I grew up in, in Fort Vermillion from the age of eight. Uh, my parents moved from southern Saskatchewan to Fort Vermillion because uh, at that time, because of the depression, I think. When I was on the board, there was a lot of one-room schools. And there was also, if I remember correctly, there was two horse and buggy or horse and sleigh people that took students into uh, maybe only one or two families into the one room school that was uh, close to them and one of these would have been at Boyer River which is uh, no longer exists of course a school uh, the other one that I remember was uh, in the Rocky Lane area the, there was some buses running in other areas at time, but there was a lot of one-room schools when I was on the board, and some of which got closed during that time. I think by the early 60s, there was very, very few left. But there was one-room schools at Savage Prairie, uh, at Blumenort, at Boy River, at Ro Rocky Lane may have had two schools, I don't know. High level had a one-room school, and uh, when it became necessary to re rebuild or expand, uh, we uh, moved the school site to where it is today. For a short period of time, Keg River and Paddle Prairie were also part of our division. When the Rocky Lane School first started, it was the first integrated school with the Indian kids from the reserve in Alberta. And uh, they came on the bus and went to the Indian Day School, which was an elaborate school just a couple miles down. But we all rode on the bus together. The bus dropped us off at the Rocky Lane School. There was no, uh, you were like this or like that. And we were all one. It didn't matter. I actually been up here uh, almost 20 years and so I think the biggest um, biggest highlights for me is just how close-knit the staff and communities are um, and how different everybody is. So geographically the school division is the size of New Brunswick so it's not a small jurisdiction but probably some of the major challenges is always teacher recruitment and retention. Um, now that we're getting some local kids uh, graduating that's great. We always felt that money could get people to come but it doesn't keep them to stay. It's us then it's a, as a responsibility to create the culture and the family that hey this is where I want to stay, this is where I want to get married and raise my kids. I came out here in 1986 with the intention of staying for two years. That was it. And that, many people will tell you that. It was a two-year plan. And then I would go back and after two years, you know, I liked where I was. I enjoyed the school. I enjoyed students and I really just felt like I was getting my feet wet and getting started in the school division. We both had good jobs. We both enjoyed being in the school division. And that was the most important thing. And we felt very comfortable with our kids as we had kids growing up here and going to school here. So it, it's been a good place to live. I knew a little bit about the area because uh, through my my relatives I had some distant connections here and so my sister had taught up here actually in 1963 to 65 so I had been here once and thought hmm I think I can enjoy that so so I came for one year and uh, ended up staying here and making this my home. We were five teachers on staff back then, still had almost as many students as they do today. 
Uh, a lot of changes have happened in the school, of course, since then, but uh, it's been a good place. A lot of good, good parental support. I think that was uh, probably the most encouraging thing for me is to realize, yeah, uh, I think the, the parents, I think the parents trusted us as teachers to do our best with their children. And uh, then, of course, we tried to live up to that trust. In the earlier years, there was some resistance by the older members of the Mennonite community to public schools. Uh, they had previously had some of their own, but they, uh, they eventually evolved into the public system and, uh, and Le Lecrete and uh, I think has graduated a lot of students going into the profession since, uh, as has Fort Vermillion and high level, of course. Yeah. So uh, my tenure on the board was a much different era than, than you find there today. I recall uh, one one-room school that got closed in the Fort Vermillion area, uh, and the students got bust in a truck, which would be totally unthinkable. <laughs> and it was a short-term answer, but it worked for a short time. And, and in those days, of course, nobody was going down the, the road at fantastic speeds or anything because they were basically operating on the old wagon trails. Eh? And there wasn't much technology in 1972 when we moved there. Um, back then, uh, the school consisted of four classrooms and an office and a gym. Um, so it was rather small. We had some years there was three grades in a classroom. Um, most years there was two, um, which quite often meant you were in a classroom with your brother or your sister, even though you weren't the same age. I grew up here, so I liked it. But I also went out and, and lived in, you know, Edmonton and, and Peace River and High Prairie and a few places like that in my career. And when I had children is when I said, you know what, if I have an opportunity to go back home, that's where I want them to grow up. Um, and that's what I've done. And now I have a granddaughter in the school. So um, it, it's, it's a great place to raise a family. So the school division has bent over backwards, I think, in trying to uh, accommodate and uh, yeah, even even modify the curriculum to the point where it could be acceptable to the different varying community values that we have, uh, and the values are quite different. We are we're diverse, diverse between Buffalo Head and and Lacrete and Blue Hills, our Mennonite community, and our community on the other side of the river. Uh, high level and area and so so I say the school division has done a remarkable job in trying to navigate some of those some of those different understandings in those early years when I was at Buffalo Head they would allow students uh, 10 days of harvest leave, leave which was excusable absence and so a lot of my students the boys at least I would miss 10 days of school in September when they were helping with harvest and stuff. Uh, yeah, it was the school division's way of saying, well, we won't call you truant during that time because we know you're needed on the farms. And that was a way of, I think, working with the community. I'd say that's the biggest success is the ability to, uh, the Fort Vermillion School Division deals with a diversity that most cities only talk about we actually live it and we're able to provide an education to all of those children. We have the indigenous uh, cultures in, in the area that make up in some cases a sizable po population in our schools, uh, the Mennonite culture and the Little Creed and surrounding area and then areas like High Level which are very cosmopolitan, um, you know, quite, quite mixed, um, uh, lots of different cultures, lots of diversity, that type of stuff. One of the things we started several years ago after I joined the board, and it's, I'm not taking credit for this, but there was, a, there was a change in philosophy with the board and administration at that time. We now go out annually and have parent meetings or community meetings in all of our schools. 
to talk about what the direction the board has, to, has taken for the school division, what are we looking at, what, is the, what are the community's needs in the school division. Um, you know, are, does the community need more tradespeople? Do they want people to go out and be professionals, teachers, nurses, doctors, that type of stuff? So it's allowed us to be more in touch with what the community actually expects out of the education system. So I think we've created a bit of an evolution within the way education is is, um, is offered up here. From Blue Hills through uh, Blue Menort, um, you know, there seems to be a real high sense of, of family involvement and school being the epicenter of the community in terms of um, where things happen and where community functions happen. Um, and then when you move into the big towns like La Crete and High Level, um, they become more facilities that are used almost on a daily basis from uh, community sports or students playing sports or um, men's leagues for basketball, those sort of things. And um, I think that's what's the the best part about being in the school division is that um, we are such a, a big part of each community um, and then when you move to Rainbow Lake it's very very driven in terms of what they want their kids to accomplish um, especially moving into post-secondary and those pieces um, much more connected to industry and that economy um, and high level of course we're tied to mills but in Lacrete we're really tied to mills too but more so on the forestry side of the of uh, the trucking and uh, removing the trees and in high level of course the mill itself uh, in terms of operation so it's nice that we have so many independent small companies that we can support and also help businesses attain uh, employees basically because what we're training whether that's through RAP or or getting them off to post-secondary so that they become the people that grow this uh, region in the north. There had always been a push on trying to find the best teachers. That's one of the advantages, that's one of the real strong points I think of the Fort Vermillion School Division. Um, even in the 80s they always went east, they went to Ontario, they'd go to BC, wherever they felt they could get the cream of the crop and that was what they liked to say, that they would go out early, January, February, March in the year and recruit and offer um, what they called open contracts at that point to be able to pick up the best. I think a 15 minute interview and I had signed on an open contract and ended up at Buffalo Head Prairie School. We all lived in teacher ages, which was, which was uh, a very good experience in some ways because, and, and so many of the schools were rural uh, and so there was housing on the schoolyard and we became a little community unto ourselves we socialized with each other, we, you know, well, whatever, we, we did a lot of wiener roasts and, <laughs> and visiting, socializing, because the communication with, with uh, relatives from outside was so limited, uh, it was letter writing. And the other reality was most of us came in from the outside. I think one of the changes that the school division has worked at is to hire more homegrown teachers. Back then, very few of us were homegrown, and uh, including myself, I, I was from Saskatoon. Uh, and so, over the during those years, we had a very high turnover of principals, of teachers, even of superintendents. And I was just recounting this morning that in 30 years, I taught under 10 principals. We've seen thousands of teachers go through the Fort Familiar School Division and, and as many staff. It's, it's hard to, it's been hard over the years to retain individuals uh, to work for long periods of time. Having said that, we retire an awful lot of staff every year who've worked for, you know, 30, 40 years with the School Division. We put a real push within the School Division to train our own alumni. So graduates of um, our high schools have been encouraged to go back, take teaching degrees, take degrees related to, the, to, the, to what the school division's needs are. And we have a significant portion of our staff now are people who grew up in this region, which has stabilized that considerably. This year alone, we have over 10 local kids that got their degree through us or through Northern Lakes um, and are homegrown so that the community norms and values that the community wants to uphold are actually being upheld by their own 
children. And that's, that's a come full circle and we're really proud of that and definitely moving that piece forward um, to uh, how many more kids that we can support through their post-secondary endeavors, especially now that um, through the whole COVID pandemic, everything is, is online. And so it's easy to support them here at home uh, with a job and with some support financially to get it done. They're very forward thinking uh, with the training for their teachers. And I had the opportunity to do two year training with their uh, balance literacy coordinator. And uh, it really improved my practice. I felt that I became a better teacher uh, after, the, after those two years were up. And I really see the growth in my students. So, and then there's opportunity for leadership. Uh, and uh, I'm enrolled in a master's program right now in educational leadership. So it's, uh, it's been really empowering for me, especially as an Indigenous person, to come back here and have those opportunities and to serve my community the way I would always wanted to. It's good for the students because it gives them role models. It also shows them that um, teachers are like me. They, they grew up here, or they grew up in Fort Vermilion, or they grew up in La Crete, no matter where you are in the school division, that's still local. So it creates, I think, a different rapport, a different relationship, and a trust as well, and, and things that they can ask their teachers that they might, about growing up in this area, that they might not ask of someone who you know came from Nova Scotia, or Newfoundland, or wherever. Um, so I think that has been a real benefit. You grow up in a small community, you get to play every sport. And when you grow up in the city, you only get to play the sport that you're the best at if you're good. It might be your favorite sport, but you're not going to get on a team because there's so many kids trying out. So I think it opens up opportunities for students that way. It allows them to see things and do things that they definitely wouldn't get to do in the city. I think back to one of the best memories I had is we had an outdoor ed class. And in January in Rainbow Lake, we went and camped and made lean-tos out on one of the rivers. Um, minus 35 at night, kids in the city probably wouldn't have the foggiest what to do to survive. When we had to go to Ponton School, like it was very cold and it didn't matter if it was minus 40 or 50, like we went to school. And the one time we were going with the team and the cutter, it's like a bobsleigh okay. and with a seat in there. And so our hands were so cold, I don't I forget forget who was driving the team, a storm came through and the path was uh, covered so we just sort of let the horses go because they knew where the path was but all of a sudden they got off the path and hit this big rock and tipped us all over <laughs> out into the snow and we, our lunches went flying all over and then the horses took off they went down to the school. So then we started walking and then um, a neighbor came along and picked us up and took us the rest of the way. There was no look in the thermometer, but with, when we went to the dog teams, or with the dog team, there, we didn't have much wind here. We still had a lot of snow. And uh, it looked like a big ice cream cone on every fence post. Because the snow just, it was soft. And, and if you went off the snow, uh, the, the, uh, toboggan uh, road or you just sunk up to your waist in the snow but there was no uh, uh, well, the way today everything is so catered to everybody you know and we had uh, when you came in and you were cold you just went by the heater and you warmed up this life goes on you know what, what do you expect I guess some expect more than, than others, you know, and I think that's, uh, that's not well. So the Fort Man School Division has always played a, a major role in First Nations partners and um, we educate students from Little Red River Cree Nation, from Tall Cree First Nation, from Beaver First Nation and from Dene Tal First Nation. Um, and each partnership is totally different in that aspect. We typically work directly with Chief and Council to, to find out what they want in each of the community. Um, and what we can do to help enhance um, language and those pieces that we're currently working on with Dene Ta for sure. And I think it's been a, it's great because it, it allows two cultures to come together and help understand that piece. I think that if there's one thing that we can do a better job in the region is understanding our differences rather than to point them out at more as, as flaws and I think that's come to light recently in the recent events is how different we are but rather than a sense of trying to seek understanding where we're 
sort of seeking judgment and I think uh, that's something we can definitely work at as a jurisdiction and, and as a region to say yeah we are all different but that's what makes Mackenzie County and the Fort Minn School Division so great. We manage to provide an education to all of the children or make available an education to all of the children in that region um, which is a you know, population in the 30 to 35,000 range so it's uh, it it's uh, it's logistically it's a daunting task and our climate, our geography, uh, are all challenges that we have to face. The Fort Williams School Division has been involved in a number of projects over the years as technology has unfolded across the province um, in terms of using smart boards, in terms of using webcams, in terms of using online resources and apps and various things to assist with students learning. However, I don't think it can ever become all important because relationships are the most important thing. If kids don't have relationships with teachers, then the kids won't learn. In my own mind, uh, education, schooling is there to help us become more rounded citizens. Not just to be skilled for an occupation, but to become more well-rounded, more informed, uh, more broadly thinking people. I think we want to produce well-rounded citizens who I think who think carefully. The one thing that really stands out to me is until you're until you're sort of in the in the unit of FESD and in the family sort of speak um, in a, in a general term, um, you just don't know what it's like. Um, and the support that teachers give each other support that support staff give each other and they just come together as a staff and and really are connected um, they work together they play together they do all of those sort of pieces and that is huge in terms of um, breeding success for kids right and if there's a highlight around that I've never worked with 600 people like this where it doesn't matter what challenge it gets thrown at them whether that's chuck egg or COVID or the flood in Fort Vermilion um, they just pick it up and it, they pick it up whether it's in a, it, whether it's in helping clean up in flood or whether it's running an evacuation center during chuck egg. Um, the staff has been phenomenal and they always just seem to be uh, a part of everything and that, I think that's the big part of being in the north is that you get an opportunity to be a part of something bigger than just a job. That's a true testament to FESD and a true um, excitement that I have for the entire region that FESD is a part of.